My name is Richard Barrett, and I am giving a talk this morning titled Byzantine Chant as a Living Tradition in the Anglophone World, Creativity, Challenges, and Ongoing Efforts. Um, just to say something very briefly about myself, um, I am uh, a PhD candidate at Indiana University in Byzantine History. I'm writing a dissertation on uh, Marian devotions in Constantinople from the 5th to the 7th century. Um, I am uh, also uh, a cantor uh, in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese. Uh, I chanted a, a church called Holy Apostles in Indianapolis, Indiana, so it was about an hour and a half, hour 45 minutes from here. Um, and <clears throat> Uh, and I am speaking this morning from the perspective of, of a practical church musician, like of a cantor. I'm not a composer, um, I'm not a musicologist, I'm a historian, and I'm a singer. Um, and I have been lucky enough to have some very good teachers where Byzantine chant is concerned. Um, but I'm, I'm approaching this from the perspective of a cantor rather than some kind of musicological expert. Um, I, I, have, I have a perspective I bring to things that um, I'd like to think is an uninformed, but I am not, I'm not the authoritative voice on scholarly issues where this stuff is concerned. So this is, this is purely a, a practical perspective. Um, and I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to try to speak to, for about 30, 35 minutes so that we at least have 10 to 15 minutes for questions, something like that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully what I say is generative of questions, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So for many reasons, Byzantine chant is uh, an orthodox sacred repertory that seems to invite dispute in the United States. Uh, in terms of its relationship to our identity as Anglophone Westerners and as Orthodox, uh, we read the words of prominent priests and bishops insisting that Byzantine chant doesn't work for English, and that what we call Byzantine chant is mostly an Arabicized 19th century invention that doesn't work for Western ears. Um, we see the notation and hear that, and we get told that it has microtones, and we freak out. Um, it's an old Eastern thing that even they don't really like all that much. So how can it be of any use to us as Americans in 2014? Right? We've all heard some variant of this, right? <clears throat> Well, today I'm going to try to give you a different perspective. I, if I'm making an argument here, it's that Byzantine chant is a living and growing body of sacred music that is actually quite well suited for English and doesn't really do anything musically that the so-called Western ear should out of hand perceive as something foreign. Uh, I'm going to present you with examples of composers who are alive today uh, that are contributing to the repertory and who have embraced all of the strange things about it rather than try to file off the edges. There's a lot of work still to be done, but what has been accomplished so far, to my mind, uh, more than adequately demonstrates that Byzantine chant is a living tradition even in English. So, uh, just to spend a moment defining terms, what is Byzantine chant? What do we mean by that? Um, we might mean a few different things uh, about it. Really broadly speaking, broadest umbrella pro uh, possible, we might mean the public sacred repertoire of the churches in the Roman Empire, uh, defined for our purposes um, from uh, 325, 330, thereabouts, uh, to 1453. Uh, 325 being the Council of Nicaea, and when Constantine decided to move the seat of the empire uh, to, uh, to Byzantium, 330 being when the city opened more or less, 1453 being when Constantinople uh, fell, to the, fell to the Ottomans. So that's one thing we might mean. Um, we might mean the sacred repertoire of the churches that identify as coming out of that heritage. Uh, as Alexander Lingus, a uh, musicologist and director of Capella Romana, puts it, the churches from Bucharest to Beirut. Um, and you know, that geographical spread, um, you know, if you think about it, that, um, that covers a lot of different languages besides Greek. Right? 
So you get Byzantine chants natively, so to speak, sung in Romanian, Greek, Arabic. Um, there are some places in Russia where it is used as the core repertoire. Uh, I believe there are some places in Bulgaria that use it as the core repertoire. Um, so you know, wherever, uh, wherever the Roman Empire was, uh, we, we, find, we find some element of this. Um, more specifically, we might mean the sacred repertoire as organized, defined, reformed, and systematized. There's a key word I'm leaving out there for a very specific reason, and I'll get to that. By um, Chrysanthos of Manitos, Gregorius Protopsalatis, and Urmuzios Hartophilax in the early 19th century. These guys are called the Three Teachers. Um, they were, uh, they took, um, they took the, the music, the, the chant books, and the system that existed up to a certain point, and um, made some revisions to the notational system, codified some things, and the chant books that we sing from today are um, either the ones that they produced or the ones their students produced or are uh, descendants, so to speak, of those books. And there are, are you know, one thing I would like to point out is that Byzantine chant is not called Byzantine chant in Greek. Um, that's, uh, you have in Greek a distinction between, um, in, in modern Greek, let's say, a distinction between psalo or pseudo and travudo, to chant versus to sing, like we do in English. Um, but in <coughs> patristic texts and in older texts, the, the distinction gets muddier. Right? Um, salo, ado, um, you know, those get used kind of interchangeably. Ado is also the word where we get ode. Okay? Uh, and then uh, trago deo, which is the which is the word that becomes trago in modern Greek. Um, you might notice that, that looks like our word tragic. Well, that's uh, that's where that's that's the, the root here. Trago deo to perform in a tragedy, to to perform in a tragic manner. Uh, in the ancient text, it doesn't really have anything to do with singing. Um, but then, if we're talking generally about Byzantine chants and references to singing in church in Greek, uh, what they're going to call it is psalmodia, psalmody, right? singing of psalms. Uh, or they're going to call it the psaltiki techni, the, the psaltic art, the psaltic craft. All right? And uh, when we're talking about music in a sacred context, the word that they might use is going to be melos, uh, or, you know, which sounds like melody. One of the, um, sometimes you'll, you'll see a pun in Greek because the word for honey is mei. Right? So when, um, uh, when the Greek fathers talk about music in church being like the honey that the doctor smears on the cup, so the melos in church is like the many that gets smeared on the cup of medicine. So this is this is a musical pun that can happen. Uh, and then let's talk about a couple of characteristics of Byzantine chant. Um, so predominantly, Byzantine chant is monophonic. Uh, what that means is uh, there is um, there is one one melody line. You know, there is um, literally one voice. Uh, it is not sung. Uh, it is not sung in a harmonized fashion. Um, wait, I hear some. I hear some of you thinking, "What about the isom?" Well, the isom, the despite how it's realized in some modern scores, the isom doesn't function as a bass line. The isom doesn't function as a separate voice. The isom is, in a lot of ways, there is a mnemonic to give the cantor singing the melody. Uh, a sense of where they are in the mode. Uh, Byzantine, to, to get into a very briefly into theoretical detail, Byzantine scales are divided into tetrachords, groups of four notes, and the isom is there to let the cantor know which tetrachord the melody is in. It's not there to function as a harmonized bass line. There are a lot of modern realizations of the isom that do it that way, as some people like to joke, follow the bouncing isom. Uh, <laughs> but that's not really what it's there to do. <coughs> Um, so Byzantine chant is monophonic. It's also modal, and what we mean by that, um, 
So in Western music, how many modes do we have usually? Sorry? I heard two. Two? Which ones? Major and minor. Major and minor. Okay. We used to have a lot more. And uh, and to um, to sort of give a nutshell explanation of what a mode is, if you take the white keys on a keyboard. You know, we, um, if we talk about a major scale, the major mode, that's C to C. Uh, the minor mode, if we're talking about what we call the natural minor, that's A to A. Right? Um, but you can do that really with any key on, uh, on the white keys, and you get a different mode, right? Uh, Dorian. and so on. Um, and we hear, um, we hear remnants of this in some of our folk melodies. Okay? Uh, if you think of uh, the tune Green Sleeves, right, that we sing uh, every Christmas to the, the words, what child is this, right? You know, the, the popular version of that melody that we all know goes da 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 etc. Right? Well, this is actually a modal melody uh, that we have kind of filed the edges off of. The, you know, the, um, the traditional version of that melody would have a raised sixth. Da 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 Right? So it's in, it's in the Dorian mode. We've made it into a minor. We made it into a um, uh, into a, a minor piece rather than a Dorian piece. But uh, that's that is a that is uh, a common example of a modal melody in in the Western repertoire. Well, Byzantine chant does all that and more. Um, you can go from you know it will it will change the starting pitch and ending pitch. We'll also change how the um, notes in between are tuned. Okay, so um, you know we're we're used to an even tempered scale. Um, you know, Byzantine chant will say that let's say D to D uh, in one tuning represents one mode, D to D in another tuning represents another mode, and so on. Um, modes also tend to have uh, characteristic intervals and characteristic melodic figures get to that. Um, and I've alluded to these couple of things already. Non-equal temperaments and formulaic composition. So non-equal temperament. Um, <clears throat> when my, my first music teacher um, was my dad, who was a, a very good, um, very good amateur musician. And he, uh, when I was about five or six, he said, you know, the only piece of music theory you'll ever need to know is, is what he called the phone number. And what this was was 02212221. That was counting half steps in a major scale. 02212221. So in Byzantine chant, that's more like 0, 12, 12, 6, 12, 12, 12, 6. Um, and it will make free use, within some reasonable limits, of those divisions of the whole step into, um, into 12 microtones. This is not as strange as it sounds. We actually do this ourselves, we just don't realize we're doing it a lot of the time. Um, if you think about it, in a choral context, what are, uh, what are the intervals that are hardest to tune? Thirds, what else, what's the other one? Fourths. Sevenths, yes, thirds and sevenths. And in a Byzantine natural diatonic scale, the third and the seventh is slightly lowered. Uh, and the, re uh, the reason why we have trouble tuning it in a choral context is because the equal temperament is actually an invention of people who build pianos. If you play a fractal instrument, you don't play equal temperaments in equally tempered scales. If you sing, you don't sing an equally tempered scale. Um, we're just used to having pianos accompany us and our accompanist is telling us, you're not quite in tune with me. Well, <laughs> um, and I hate it when pianos play the line. Um, but uh, any string player will tell you they have to play the leading tone sharper, right, than they would if it were just a half step into the tonic, right? 
Um, so this is this is not as this is not as strange as it seems. Formulaic composition. So each mode has characteristic phrases uh, that it uses that uh, bring us to the next point. Uh, tend to reflect textual stress. Okay, so this melodic figure in this mode goes with this pattern of textual stress. I'll show you examples of this. Um, different melodic textures based on liturgical function. Uh, so you can have fast syllabic hymns, you can have slower melismatic hymns, you can also have what are called papadic hymns, which are the really, really slow um, settings of what tend to be short texts. Um, so, praise the Lord from the heavens, alleluia, uh, stretched out into ten minutes. And that's called papadic because you're accompanying the priest's action. And there's, there's a liturgical reason you're doing it this way. And finally, uh, uh, Byzantine chant employs a system of pneumatic notation uh, interpreted via a layer of oral tradition. Now, let me translate oral tradition for you. It means performance practice. And we do this too. Just to give you an example. So, this is um, from the most Western piece of what, uh, out of the Western repertoire I could possibly think of, Handel's Messiah. <laughs> so this is the opening wretched, comfort you my people. Um, this is the, uh, here we have the very, very last, uh, very, very last line. Has anybody played this as a pianist in here, just out of curiosity? No? Okay. So what we have in this last line, we have a, we have a free wretched ative um, with, uh, with chords underneath. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And if you can see, this projector is in, uh, the resolution is a little less than I would have liked, but right underneath God, uh, you have the 5 1 cadence. For our God, dum, bum, bum. Well, you don't ever actually play it that way, even though that's what the score says. Any, piano, any accompanist worth their salt will know that. Uh, they're going to wait to do the 5-1 cadence until the singer has cut off on God. For our God, bum, bum, even though that's not what's in the score. Uh, so that is performance practice, right? Even though that's what the score says, that's not what you do. Uh, and also, uh, you heard, maybe heard me do this a couple of times, there are ornaments in here that aren't in the score, but, uh, but are what you, that are what you usually sing anyway. Very dryly speaking, this is make straight in the desert a highway for our God. But you never sing that if you want to get hired for this piece. Okay? <laughs> make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Right? That's not in the score, but it's what you do. Um, and, and just a, a plea on notation. So the way I like to explain notation is it's the difference between Google Maps turn-by-turn -turn directions and uh, an absolute route plotted on a map. Okay? Uh, in an absolute route plotted on a map, you have geography outlined for you. Right? You have uh, you know, a bunch of locations positioned relative to each other. Um, and then you have, you know, a, a geographical representation of the route. That's staff notation. Okay? Uh, Byzantine notation is turn by turn directions. And you have a starting point. Uh, you go this far, then you turn right. You go this far, then you turn left. You go this far, and then finally you're at your destination. And here's a mile marker to show you that if you've done the right things, this is where you should be. It's, it, it, yes, fine, the squiggles look odd uh, when you're first looking at them, but when you realize the logic behind them, it becomes a lot less intimidating. Now, you know, how you might describe oral tradition is, 
Okay, Google turn by turn map says I go here, and then I turn right, and then I go here, and then I turn left. But you know there's this coffee shop that I always go to that's right across the street. I think I'm going to stop there for a mocha, and then I'll go around that block, and then join back up with uh, the turn by turn directions. So we might think of it that way. So then we have the question, what isn't Byzantine chant? Byzantine chant is not a musical system invented by the three teachers. This is something that you will hear asserted that what we call Byzantine chant is a 19th century invention for all intents and purposes. Really not the case. Uh, there are, um, again, what they did was they, uh, their efforts were of a reform organizational system, uh, systematizational um, uh, character, not of an inventive character. Um, they understood what they were doing as um, taking what existed and making it um, uh, and um, making it better. Uh, and it was it was not a in, it cut things out of whole cloth kind of, kind of uh, endeavor. No, by the same token, it was not a musical system dictated to the apostles by Christ himself. Uh, we have to make that clear. Nor is it a musical system that has gone through no change whatsoever since 330 AD. That's very much not the case. That's demonstrably not the case. Um, what we can demonstrate is that there is continuity in terms of approach, in terms of style, um, in terms of notation, uh, you know, we can see, we can take a, um, a hymn like the Kandakian for the Five Sundays of Lent to, to the Ochampian leader. We can, um, we can follow that from the earliest notated versions of that we have in Greek up to the way we sing it today. And we can see how it gets from point A to point X. That does not mean that point A and point X are identical. Um, but there is continuity. Uh, it's also not a fixed or a closed repertoire. And it never has been. I, I, you will hear this asserted. Well, uh, Byzantine chant is the body of repertoire that people already know. You can't write new melodies and call it Byzantine chant. Well, that's nonsense. Um, that's, uh, that is not the case. It's demonstrably not the case. There are still people in Greece composing. There are still people in uh, Lebanon and Syria composing. People in Romania composing. And there are people here composing. Uh, it is not a musical system that is completely ill-suited to English, and I will show you why. It is also not a musical system that is fundamentally culturally Eastern. What do I mean by that? Um, there is a wonderful book uh, called The Sound of Medieval Song by the musicologist Timothy McGee. And he is able to demonstrate that up until the 11th or 12th century, I think, what you have is basically a pan-Mediterranean musical ethos that stretches from, uh, stretches from the west coast of Europe into, uh, into Asia Minor and even into India that is modal, that is um, florid, that is ornamented, uh, that is definitely not equal-tempered. And that what winds up happening is that in the 12th and 13th century, it is, you know, you have a, you have a, a group of musicians in Western Europe who you know, take a hard, hard right turn away from that musical ethos, and that's out of that that we get what we now think of as tonal music. Okay? Um, so this is not something that is somehow inherently a product of the East. Um, this is... And even now, most world music uh, is, uh, shares these characteristics of modality, of microtonality, and so on and so forth, rather than equal tempered tonal, tonal harmony. That is, equal tempered, equal tempered tonal harmony is really an outlier in the grand scheme of things. So then, back to the question of what is Byzantine chant? It is a living tradition comprising a rich, diverse, multilingual repertoire. Now we have, for English purposes, there are some pioneers of Byzantine chant in English we can talk about. Um, first and foremost of these, perhaps, is Basil Kazan, uh, who was um, up to a certain point a priest in Louisville, Kentucky. 
Uh, and then he, I, th I think he ended his life in New York. Um, finished his life, I should say. Um, fell asleep. Uh, and he is responsible for um, the mammoth endeavor called the, the, the Byzantine Project. It's published by the Antiochian Archdiocese. That is still in use today. Uh, these are staff notation editions of um, Vespers, Orthros, uh, the Menaean, the Pentecostalian, uh, and these are adaptations of um, these are adaptations of the uh, the Arabic Byzantine chant tradition. Um, then there's David Melling. Uh, he was uh, an English uh, an English cantor who was also the dean of humanities at Manchester Metropolitan University, I believe. He was actually a, a scholar of Indian philosophy uh, who, became, who became orthodox and became interested in Byzantine chant. And he, um, he composed a number of uh, English language settings uh, for Byzantine chant and staff notation. Uh, there's also Father Seraphim Didis, uh, who is a, a priest and a monk in the Greek archdiocese who did a lot of early English language adaptations for them. Alexander, the aforementioned Alexander Lingus, who, um, when he was the choir director uh, in, um, at the cathedral in Portland, Oregon, did, uh, he, he did a lot of early efforts of adapting into English. And then uh, Father Ephraim, aka Papa E, uh, who is presently at St. Anthony's Monastery in Arizona, uh, who also did a lot of early efforts um, in adaptation and digital typesetting and so on. Now we have some issues with English language use that all of these guys run into. There's the issue of notation. Kazan, as I understand it, actually intended the, the Byzantine project to be a Byzantine uh, effort. And I, I, I am told that uh, there is an archive where you can actually see his early Byzantine scores uh, before he uh, before he shifted gears. Um, so how do you represent some of these things on staff notation if you're not going to use Byzantine notation? Uh, how do you represent, you know, slightly flatted third, that kind of thing? Uh, that's one issue. Um, then translation is an issue. Uh, we don't have a standardized translation. Um, we don't have, um, in a lot of cases, metered translations. Um, in some cases we do, but uh, certainly when these guys were composing, we didn't. Okay? Um, and uh, there are also issues of maybe not fully understanding the relationship of text to music. So the ways that the, the, te the text gets set with some of these early adaptations can feel a little awkward. Tuning. Um, Vocal style, and I'll, I'll say what I mean about that in a second, and then performance practice. These are all sort of, uh, these are all sort of overlying issues that these early pioneers ran into. And here's, here's an example of how that worked. Um, John and Matthew, if I could borrow you for a second. I am so borrowed. Yes, you are. Um, let's see, you might have an easier time reading off of this. Maybe not. Well, okay, so this is the third mode, um, the third mode the uh, resurrectional Theotokian sung at Vespers and Matins. Uh, and this is the, the version out of the Greek, uh, the Greek Anastasi Metarian, the Greek resurrectional hymnal. Uh, and this goes something like this. Um, so, tone three, so E song basically on F, follow us for the changes. No, no. Uh, 
Uh, you can't quite see, can't see the text as well as I would like, but here we are. So this may be familiar to some of you. <laughs> Thee who art the mediatrix for the salvation of our race, we praise, O virgin Theodotus, for in the flesh assume from thee, after that he had suffered the passion of the cross, thy Son and our God delivered us from corruption, because he is the mother of mankind. Not bad, as these things go. Um, a couple of issues, though, that might be evident. The first word, the, that first phrase, thee who art the mediatrix for the salvation of our race, we praise, O Virgin Theotokos. I don't know about you guys, I can't count the number of cantors who have instinctively changed that to thou. Uh, so what, what Kazan has done here is he's followed the Greek word order. The, the, the Greek hymn starts with se, which is the uh, accusative case of the word you. Okay? So it's the object of the verb praise. We praise thee, O Virgin Theotokos. In English, though, that sounds tortured. Just putting, putting it bluntly. And so when you see that, if you aren't thinking ahead to what's happening on the next line, you assume that's a mistake. Thou who art the mediatrix for the salvation of our race, we praise, O Virgin Theotokos. And then we praise, O Virgin, o Virgin Theotokos becomes the object of we praise, right? You, you sort of instinctively rewrite the hymn to follow syntax you're familiar with. That's one problem. Um, the rhythmic subdivision is a little odd. Be who art the mediatrix for the salvation of our race. I'm, I'm not totally sure what's going on there. Um, and now some of this is because Kazan is working with Nasser's translation rather than his own, but these are the issues nonetheless. Now here's, uh, here's how Didis does it. He basically, uh, to, to sum up very quickly, Didis preserves the Greek melody almost entirely uh, at the expense of the translation. The translation is a little strange. I'll leave it at that. Um, now, what I'd like to suggest is that there's another way to do it. And this is where Father, uh, this is where Father a Friend comes in. And that is, you take a good translation that is intended to... Um, be more or less real English, let's say, uh, and instead of trying to shoehorn it into the pre-existing Byzantine melody, you compose a new Byzantine melody following the compositional process of Byzantine music to come up with a new hymn. So Matthew and John, one more time. So here's the result when that's what, uh, so this is Father of Friend using Holy Transfiguration Monastery's translation, I'll point out that they solved Kazan's problem right off the bat. We praise thee, the mediator of the salvation of our race. No, no. We praise thee, the mediator for the salvation of our race, O Virgin Theodotos, for in the flesh my son and our God have deigned to endure the passion through the cross, and hath redeemed us from corruption, since he is the friend of man. That's lovely. Yeah, that's, that's completely different, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah. And it sounds like natural English. It sounds like Byzantine chant. Uh, and uh, you hear enough of how, if, for somebody who's familiar with the Greek melody, they would hear enough of, uh, enough echoes, let's say, of the Greek melody that would be like, oh, that's what this is, but it's composed for the English language. Right? So that's, that's the way forward here. And in terms of the current state of things, we have a number of we have a number of English language resources that are helpful. Um, the, Greek Arch the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese recently published 
uh, the English language Byzantine music theory and practice guide. We have a couple of very good uh, English language recordings for Byzantine chant that have started to appear. Uh, Capella Romana's Divine Liturgy in English, where all the scores are composed in the way we just discussed. Um, recently, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox Seminary put out uh, a recording of the uh, Holy Week Passion Service, half in Greek, half in English. The English hymns, uh, English portions are also composed in exactly the same way. Um, we have the, the English language composer for both of those recordings in our midst. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, and then liturgical texts are uh, liturgical texts are becoming. I don't want to say uniform because that's definitely not happening. But good versions of texts are becoming increasingly more available. Uh, Holy Transfiguration Monastery just finally reprinted their revised Pentecostarian after 25 years of the first edition coming out. Good Lord. Um, so, uh, their, their, their liturgical texts do try to preserve meter where that's necessary, um, which, uh, which is very helpful. And uh, just to say something very briefly about the current crop of composers, the four I could talk about, John Michael Boyer, uh, Gabriel Cremines, Basil Crow, and Jessica Sushi Bilalis. Um, so, uh, in the time I have remaining, how do I, let's see. The thing I want to do here is just show you really brief examples from all four of these guys, and then hopefully have a couple minutes for questions still. So, just to take, um, since we just had Pentecost, the hymn, O Heavenly King. So, this is the Greek version out of the Greek chant books. This is Kazan's adaptation of the same hymn. And the thing, I don't have time to sing both of these for you, so the thing that I want to point out is that this is actually, a, it's, not a, it's not a papadic setting by any means, but it is a, it is a setting that uses melisma. Uh, and Kazan has made his version very, very syllabic. Uh, it's slow, but it's still syllabic. Um, and the, the step I would like to, I, I can't talk about in any, any depth here, uh, is um, the Arabic chant books that Kazan would have, that Kazan would have been referencing. Uh, my understanding is that he, uh, he was referencing a, uh, he was referencing a set of chant books that is more in line with the tradition of somebody called John Sakalaridis rather than um, the tradition of the three teachers. I don't have time to talk about that uh, in any detail, but um, let's see. So, uh, same hymn by two of the, this new crop of composers whom I mentioned. Boyer's version, Basil Crow's version. Uh, Basil Crow is um, a priest uh, priest's son in the Antiochian Archdiocese. He presently is, uh, he presently is the Lampadarios, or left chanter, at the uh, an Annunciation Cathedral in San Francisco. Um, both of these hymns more or less went through the same compositional process independently of each other. Um, the only real difference is translation. John is using the translation of Archimand rightly from Lash. Uh, Basil is using the translation of Holy Transfiguration Monastery. Um, let's sing the first couple of lines, sure. I guess. Uh, <coughs> what's that? Well, okay, well, we'll see what we'll see what we can do here. Yeah. <laughs> Again, 
Different translation, same process. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 I thank God I am not a priest. 
I would not want to have to make these kinds of decisions to make to figure out, you know, how to divide this or that baby. Um, but pastoral support really is an issue, uh, and um, you know, I don't think there are, I don't think there are any responsible cantors who are saying just hand the whole thing over to us and, and you know the choir can go hang up their robes. I don't think anybody responsible is saying that. Um, but there. You know, there, there, there needs to be a different model that emerges of how this stuff works. Because this living repertoire will only continue to live if, there, if we can actually sing it in church. If we can't learn this stuff and then actually sing it in church, we're learning it for ourselves, not for the church. Okay. Um, and then finally, there are a number of common misperceptions and, shall we say, popular but misguided narratives that are out there about Byzantine chant. And I started off talking about some of these. Um, these are well-intentioned, um, but they're based on old scholarship. Um, they're based on, I would go so far as to say, outdated, outdated attitudes to, towards what we in academic circles call orientalizing. And, uh, and I, you know, I understand very well that um, you know, it matters you know, when the language issue comes up, something I like to I like to say is, it matters that you hear the language you remember your grandmother praying in. Uh, and I think it also, to an extent, it matters you remember. It matters that you hear the music you could imagine your grandmother singing. So this stuff matters, but that is not to say that because you don't remember your grandmother singing Byzantine chant, that it's uh, that it is uh, an Oriental relic that has no places in American churches. It is, in fact a living repertoire that is well suited to the English language uh, and that is by no means exclusively a cultural Eastern product. So with that, I hope I have a couple of minutes for questions. Uh, I'll stop talking. Thank you. Um, yes, Peter. Actually, can I just jump in really quick? Yes. I think I have to leave. Uh, Father Sergei has arrived. Uh, when you're done here, uh, probably in the next five, ten minutes, uh, Vlad Morrison is going to be uh, giving his talk in, in Greece. So the hall, big hall, is where you want to be after this. Take the elevator down, hang a right, the first floor, and then you'll see it. When is he starting? Uh, he is starting uh, probably around 10, 15. Okay. Uh, firm. Okay, so very good. So let's, let's say we have 10 minutes for questions then. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Yes, uh, well, actually, Peter, I saw your hand first before the curtain. I've had the, uh, the real pleasure and uh, mind-expanding experience to be working as a choir director in a Greek church for the last six years, uh, which helped me shed some of my Slavic misconceptions about the role of the choir in, in liturgical music. But I, I see that the problems that you've discussed, I see them in my parish. Mm -hmm. And it is this start that got me between what the chanters are doing and what the choir is doing. Sure. And I've tried to breach that by chanting with the chanter and, and expressing to him the desire to learn how to chant at least that much in sure. his lifetime. But how do you see this this tension playing out in the sense that, you know, we have the the shining light, the bright lights, John Michael Boyer, and of course Alexander Ringer and yourself, individuals are really showing how to chant in English and how to make this more accessible to the brain. Right. How do we reconcile this in reality, this dichotomy that we have in the Greek parishes, perhaps even in the Antiochian parishes? Well, so my my approach to that, first of all, you know, I uh, I come from a background of being a trained Western musician. I come from the world of Western classical music. Um, so I, and I, you know, I sang Russian choral repertoire before I ever learned a new a Byzantine chant. Uh, this is this is both a good this is both a good and a problematic thing. The good thing there is that um, as long as it's not in a Slavonic font, uh, you know, I can I I am somebody who can basically jump in wherever and and be comfortable. Um, the the other thing about that that made that a challenge when it came to learning Byzantine chant is that, you know, the Sunday where my priest said, oh, you want to learn to chant? Here's Kazan. Go up there. Good luck. Um, which is kind of what happens in a lot of parishes. 
you know, uh, I didn't know any better. I, I saw um, uh, uh, you know, I saw the, the first line of the praises and you know, saw staff notation being and being a good Western trained musician. Let everything that has breath, and you know, uh, that's that. So this is my this is another part of my plea for the notation. The Byzantine notation is a visual marker that you need to do something different here. Um, so anyway, my, where I'm going with this is, I think of myself perhaps as a Byzantine specialist. I don't think of myself as a Byzantine partisan. So I am somebody who, as a, as a church musician, can bridge these roles. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm someone who can bridge these roles. Yeah. I think that, and I think that John would say the same thing about himself. I think there are other cantors who say the same things about themselves. So I think it is incumbent upon us as cantors who are also, you know, more generally musicians, to take advantage of the opportunities that we have to go from himself to the choir law. Uh, and you know, say, hey, I can do both. How about you in the choir loft? Why don't you come down to the the, the with me next Sunday? Uh, you know, so that the bridge goes both ways. And you know, if in the Greek Orthodox Church diocese, if you go to a choir federation meeting, you will see lots and lots and lots of choir of, of choral singers. You'll see one or two chanters, because the chanters, for various reasons, think, oh, they I don't belong there. Want them. Well, they, they, maybe they don't want to be there. Maybe they think they aren't supposed to be there. And you know, I personally want to, on a um, personal mission in the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese to say, hey, we chanters, we need to flood these meetings, not stay away from them. Uh, so if, if we show that we're willing to build bridges, I think that can help. Um, you know, if, if we all say, hey, we're all in the same boat, a rising tide lifts all boats. More is more. Um, rather than if I get ice cream, that means you get less ice cream. Uh, you know, I think that I think that would help a lot. Do you think? Do you think also? And I, I, I'll stop asking questions that so many have arisen. Sure. Uh, do you think also this could be addressed at the seminary level, where where future priests understand this? Uh, attention and, sure. and can approach it intelligently. Well, in, in, in GOA right now at least, uh, it is being addressed at the seminary level in the sense that priests right now are getting a pretty thorough grounding in Byzantine chant. And would you say that's accurate? Yeah. I mean, Menos is doing a lot of very good work there. In as much as they pay attention. In as much as they pay attention. Well, but they can't say that they weren't, they can't say that nobody tried to teach it to them. Right. So you don't have a generation, you'll have a generation of priests who are theoretically competent chanters, who know what's going on, will have some musical, you know, some base level of musical knowledge, um, you know, who will then hopefully be able to apply that pastorally. So that's, that's happening right now, at least in GOA. I, I, I have a harder time speaking for the Antiochian Archdiocese, because mm -hmm. they, they, they might go to St. Vlad's, they might go to St. Tegon's, uh, they might go to Holy Cross, so it's, it's a little bit more of a mixed bag. Uh, but you know, it, it gets back to the issue of pastoral support, certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you got a question over here. Uh, <clears throat> not, not so much of a question, just a uh, uh, observation. A lot, a lot of the issues you brought up totally apply to uh, the, the Russian uh, church as well. And uh, as a composer of both Slavonic and English music, I wrote a piece in English, or I wrote a Slavonic. And for whatever reason, I have to translate it to the other language. And exactly what point happened, I could not do it. You know, couldn't fit the words into the music. I had to rewrite the music, to the words, and so forth. And uh, it's the only way to do it. Yeah. And it, it presents a problem for those who harmonize um, chants, for mm -hmm. those who take pieces of known composers and translate them into a language. It inevitably results in less than ideal. Uh, result, but you know, should you not do that? That's you know, it would be great to hear in English some of these famous Russian poets or whatever, but at the same time, it can never be construed as a, a final product. No, and, and, and a lot of that, you know, uh, the music in a Russian world context, certainly, I mean, you have a lot of text painting and whatnot that. You know, if, if you're doing it to a translation, it, it, the, you lose that relationship. 
you know, even if you can find sort of a metrically appropriate uh, translation, if you know th those are those are other issues that can arise, and if you lose that organic connection, it it, uh, it becomes its own problem. Um, you know, I, I, in an ideal world, you know, we would be okay with we would feel more okay with saying, okay, you know, if this hymn is in Slavonic and this other stuff is in English, or you know, so on and so forth. We would feel a little less. In an ideal world, we would we would feel more I don't know um, challenged in a good way by that rather than uh, I didn't understand that so I feel threatened by it in an ideal world. But it's it's a it's a pastoral difficulty certainly. Father, so kind of two questions which in my mind are related. One is you give the start as three twenty five for this tradition. So I'm curious. Uh, I, mean, I have to admit knowing nothing about this as to how things go prior to that. That mm -hmm. is, there's lots of evidence of uh, our iconographic tradition uh, being drawn from Jewish uh, synagogue mm -hmm. practices, uh, similar things with liturgical uh, elements in those first centuries. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in the musical tradition at that starting point of 3, 325, where it comes from before. And the second question is, um, and this is just for someone who's been in the Russian uh, tradition, how, uh, for example, O Heavenly King, that you sang here beautifully, mm -hmm. how does someone who's praying at home pray that? Do they sing it that way in this tradition? So those mm -hmm. are just, so they're related in my mind. Sure. Well, and, and the, the way, for me, how they're related is that previous to um, the Edict of Milan in 313, Christianity is more of a private affair rather than you know a, a matter of public ceremony. Um, so, you know, we can only push the musical evidence so far. Uh, it's 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 likely that a lot of you know certainly the temple had antiphonal psalmody. Um, the um, uh, in the fifth century church history of Saws, and then he pushes um, uh, he he brings in the issue he brings in the practice of antiphonal psalmody by relating it to a vision. That Ignatius of Antioch would have had of the angels in heaven in the second century. Um, the you have a letter from in the early second century. You have a letter from um, Pliny the Younger to Trajan, um, where he describes Christians as when they gather, they sing a hymn responsibly uh, or antiphonally. In, in weekend is the Latin word. Um, so you know that there are a number of. You know, there, are, there are a number of sort of glimpses we get of how these things would have worked. You know, our earliest musical manuscripts, unfortunately, don't go back much further than the ninth century, thereabouts. And we get a phonetic notation like the eighth century. Um, so it's like we get we get little witnesses of things, but it's it's we can't really piece together a whole picture. But there's no evidence that the that this singing tradition was something which had been adopted cloth from the existing pagan Roman tradition. Is well, there, or, or it's... Is, is, I, mean, I have these are fields that I don't zero Yeah, about. it's hard to say. So if you look at, um, you know, certainly in the, in the Greco-Roman tradition, there is a big tradition of, of uh, hymns being composed for festivals. In the, in, uh, the Greek literature, you have Pindar, uh, for example. Um, but these are really, really highly... Um, Highly, shall we say, literarily elite endeavors, and you know the and the, the the certainly the Septuagint Greek is not an elite, uh, not an elite register of of, uh, of literature. Um, it's it's really hard to say because there there's this, the, the the evidence that we have can only allow us to reconstruct the picture so much. Uh, it, you know, we we have a witness to a glad some light being referred to as an ancient hymn. In the second or third century, by Saint Basil. Yeah, by Saint Basil. Um, so it's you know we, we can we can see flashes of this, that, and the other thing, but it's in terms of, of a full picture, it's really hard to say. What we think we know is that previous to the legalization of Christianity, Christian as a private religion probably was mostly I don't want to say silent, but but certainly it, there would have been less of an emphasis on. Um, show, uh, you know, showy public displays, and you know, if you're trying to not get arrested, probably singing very loudly as a group is is not going to be uh, the best thing you want to do. 
Does that help at all? Well, it's 10, 12, so in the interest of uh, respecting Vlad's time, we should probably get downstairs. Thank you all very much.